الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith in our previous episode we had discussed the blessings and the importance of studying the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal in today's episode we're going to continue from that theme and talk about some very important principles regarding the Tawheed of Allah's names and attributes. In other words, how do we understand these names and attributes and what do we do with them? Stay tuned for today's show. Today's topic is about some basic principles regarding how we understand and believe in the names and attributes of Allah. And these principles have been derived because of the fact that a lot of controversy has existed throughout the centuries. Many different groups have come, groups that have been influenced by Greco-Roman philosophy, by other religions, regarding the true nature of these names and attributes. So we're going to take you back to the Qur'an and Sunnah as we always do, and we're going to study how we should understand these names and attributes of Allah. And I'm going to mention in today's episode, six such basic principles. But I would like to mention that this is a very, very brief introduction. Obviously, this is a very important science, and one which we can expound hours and hours on. So our purpose today in this short 30 minute segment is to just highlight, outline if you like, some basic guiding posts of how we should understand these names and attributes of Allah. Before we jump into these six points, we have to first define what is a name and what is an attribute. What's the difference between the name and the attribute? Because I've been using these terms a lot, the names and attributes of Allah. Basically, a name of Allah is something that we call Allah by and also that contains an attribute in it. So the name is something that you make dua with. A name is something which is found in the Quran and Sunnah, describing Allah and calling out to Him as well. Whereas the attribute only contains an attribute. It doesn't necessarily contain a name as well. Let me give you an example to clarify this point. Ar-Rahman is the name of Allah. We say, Ya Rahman, O Rahman, have rahma, have mercy on me. It also has the attribute, Ar-Rahman has the attribute of Rahmah or mercy in it. So this is a name of Allah, it's found in the Quran and Sunnah. It is used to call Allah. And it is also containing a name, or a, sorry, an attribute, a meaning, which is Rahmah or mercy. An example of an attribute is anger. We say in the Quran, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Not the path of those whom Allah is angry with. So one of the attributes of Allah is anger. But is that his name as well, the one who gets angry? No. No. Therefore, we differentiate between the names and the attributes. The names, they contain a name, which is something that you use to call out. And they also contain a description, which is an attribute. Whereas an attribute does not necessarily, does not necessarily induce a name. Many attributes do. The attribute of forgiveness gives you al-ghaffar, al-tawwab, al-rahman. But not every attribute gives you a name. For example, one of Allah's attributes is speech. Allah speaks. He spoke the Qur'an. But is the one who speaks one of the names of Allah? No. The same applies for anger. We gave the example of anger. So these are, to, to summarize, a name of Allah includes in it something which you call out to, something which you use to call out Allah to, and it also includes a description a characteristic or an attribute as well. Whereas an attribute does not necessarily include, does not necessarily induce a name. With this brief introduction of the difference between names and attributes, we'll now jump into six basic principles that we must believe in with regards to these names and attributes. The first one is narrated to us and informed to us in Surah A'raf, verse 180. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna." Surah A'raf, verse 180. And to Allah belongs Asma'ul Husna. The names of Husna. Husna means the most perfect, the most beautiful, the most majestic names. So this is the first principle. All of Allah's names and attributes are attributes and names of majesty, of perfection. There is no name or attribute that has any negative connotation with them. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna. Any name and attribute that is found in the Quran and Sunnah, any name and attribute of Allah is a name and attribute of perfection, of majesty, of glory. The second principle is found in this verse as well. And that is that we cannot invent names and attributes from ourselves. Because Allah says that to Him belong the names and attributes, the which are well known, al-asma. Where are they well known? In the Quran and Sunnah. So this is the second principle, that the names and attributes of Allah are those found in the Qur'an and Sunnah. We have no right to sit back and say, well, I think Allah should be called this, and I think Allah should be characterized as this. A'udhu Billah. No. Allah has told us in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah, His names and attributes, and these are the names and attributes we utilize. We do not go beyond the Qur'an and the Sunnah. There's an ayah in the Quran which also mentions this, Surah A'raf, verse 33. Allah says that, inform that Allah has prohibited upon you all lewd and evil deeds and transgression, and that you kill people without justice, without any reason, and that you commit shirk with Allah, and the last thing, that you say about Allah that which you do not know. You speak about Allah based upon ignorance. You do not know the names and attributes of Allah, and you invent them yourselves. No. This is the greatest sin. In fact, it is one of the stepping stones to shirk. In one hadith, if you can hand me uh, Ibn Hibban, volume 3. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ himself clearly outlined that the names and attributes of Allah are only those that are found in the Quran and the Sunnah. We have no right to invent names and attributes ourselves. Jazakallah khair, Sam. We turn to Sahih Ibn Hibban, hadith number 972. The Prophet ﷺ said that any Muslim who is in any distress and grief and then makes this dua, which we'll translate now, that he makes this dua, then Allah will remove his grief from him. So what is this beautiful dua? The dua is, O oh Allah, I am your servant and the son of your servant and the son of your female servant as well. In other words, my parents were also servants to you. My forehead is in your hand. In other words, you control everything that I do and say. Okay, I cannot disobey you. Ma'udhin fiya hukmuk, your judgment occurs in me. Whatever you decide and will, it must occur. I ask you, by every name that you have named yourself with, this is the point here, where do the names come from? I ask you by every single one of your names that belongs to you, and you have named yourself with, whether it was revealed in the books, or taught to one of your creations, or kept in the knowledge of the unseen with you, that you make the Qur'an the light of my heart, and the light of my eye, the sweetness of my eye, and that you use it to remove grief from me, and all of my worries and problems, you use it to remove it from me, except that Allah will remove your grief from you. The point of this hadith, is a beautiful hadith, it's a beautiful dua, that we should make and memorize, when we are in any distress, any situation of grief, we say, Oh Allah, I ask you by every name that you have named yourself, which belongs to you. Whether it was revealed in the books, it's in the Quran or Sunnah, or it was taught to one of your creations, you taught it to some angel, or you taught it to some of the prophets, or you have kept it in the knowledge of the unseen that no one else knows about it. I ask you by all of these names, that you make the Quran, the light of my heart, the spring of my heart, and the light of my eye, the coolness of my eye, to the end of the dua. The point is that this hadith clearly mentions for us where do the names come from? Who has the right to name Allah? Only Allah Himself. Only. As this hadith says, that the names that you have chosen for yourself. So to describe Allah or to name Allah by any name or attribute that is not found in the Quran and Sunnah is a type of shirk and a type of kufr, a type of evil and sin. Whatever it is, we have no right to speak about Allah except the way that He speaks about Himself. 
And yet we find, unfortunately, it's very common. We, say, we, we hear, for example, Allah is the architect of the universe. The architect of the universe, this is an attribute. Allah did not call himself this. Rather, he called himself much better than this. Al-Musawwir, Al-Badi'r. The one who gives shape, the one who fashions. So, we don't go beyond the Quran and the Sunnah. Whatever we find in the Quran and Sunnah, that is where we go. This is the second principle. The third principle is that the names of Allah are infinite in number. Infinite. They have no end to them. What is the proof for this? The proof is this hadith that we have just quoted right now. Because Allah said, or the Prophet ﷺ said that you should make dua using all of Allah's names, whether they are found in the Quran and Sunnah, or revealed to another Prophet, or, what was the third? Kept hidden with him. Which shows you that the names of Allah are limitless. The attributes of Allah are infinite. We cannot confine them to a certain number. Now many people misunderstand the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Akhi, if you can hand me volume 13 of Sahih Bukhari. Many people misunderstand uh, a certain hadith. So let's look up this hadith and see what it says. And cure or try to explain both of these hadith together. The hadith which says Allah has infinite names and this hadith. Hadith number 7000. 392, if you can look that up yourselves, it says that to Allah belongs 99 names. Whoever memorizes them enter paradise, enters paradise. From this hadith, many people misunderstand that Allah only has 99 names. Allah has 99 names. This is the common misconception. But none of the major scholars of Islam, none of them understood this. What this hadith says is Allah has 99 names from these infinite names. From the names found in the Quran and Sunnah, there are 99 that occupy a special status. What is this status? Whoever memorizes these names will enter paradise. So this is a common misconception. None of the famous scholars understood this. Because it, the, the hadith clearly says that to Allah belong 99 names, such that if you memorize them, you will enter paradise. It doesn't say that Allah only has 99 names. No. Of the many names found in the Quran and Sunnah, and if we look at the Quran and Sunnah, we find over 100 names. We find... Some, some scholars even have found 200 names in the Quran and Sunnah. So even of the, the, uh, the knowledge that we have in the Quran and Sunnah, we find more than 99 names. The point is that of those names, there are 99 which occupy a special status. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back continuing along with these six points of discussion. <laughs> And if you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassiri who are trying to find out where are these seven earths, earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to notice only in the 20th century. The true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth. The fourth principle with regards to the sixth principle we're going to talk about today, the fourth principle is that there is one name of Allah which occupies the highest status. And this is called the greatest name of Allah. Um, if we look up, Akhi, if you can hand me volume 4 of Sunan Abi Dawood, Abdul Rahman, if you can hand me volume 4, we'll look up a hadith in which the Prophet wasallam mentions that Allah has one special name, one Name which stands up above the rest. We turn to hadith number 1493 in Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, excuse me, Sunan Abi Dawood. And by the way, this is Sunan Abi Dawood along with an explanation by Shamsul Haq al-Azim Abadi, which is the best explanation of Sunan Abi Dawood. He has written it in over 14, 15 volumes. It is the most detailed explanation. And he was a famous scholar from India of the previous century, or I believe 150 years ago he passed away. Um, hadith number 1492. The Prophet ﷺ said that verily Allah has a great name, Ismul A'zam, the greatest name, such that whoever uses this name of Allah in a dua, Allah will give him what he wants. So we believe then that there is one name of Allah which 
is the grandest name, the most majestic name, which stands up above all other names. All of Allah's names are perfect. All of Allah's names are beautiful. But there is one which is the most beautiful, the most majestic. What is this name? Scholars have differed. But it seems, and Allah knows best, that it is either the name Allah or al hayyul Qayyum together. Because when you combine the evidences where the Prophet ﷺ said that this is the name or this ayah contains this name or this hadith contains this name, when you combine all of this, you find that really it narrows down to two choices. Either this grand name is Allah itself, the name Allah itself. Because Allah means Al-Ilah and we define Ilah is the object that is worshipped. So Al-Ilah means the only one that is worthy of worship. So this name is the most comprehensive name of Allah. Or, according to some scholars, it is al hayyul Al-Qayyum. But the point is, whatever is the case, there is one name that stands up as the Ismullah Al-A'zam, or the greatest name of Allah. The fifth principle of these six principles is that Allah has severely warned us from straying away from these names. In Surah A'raf, verse 180, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the same verse, to Allah belongs the most beautiful names, so make dua to Him with it, and leave those who turn away, who deviate with regards to His names. Leave those who leave, who, who deviate from the correct path. In other words, Allah is saying, have nothing to do with them. So Allah has warned us against deviating from these names and attributes of Allah. How can deviation occur? Well, a number of ways. Firstly, by inventing names and attributes from yourself. This is one type of deviation. Secondly, to name idols after his names and attributes. Because the mushrikun or the pagan Arabs, they would take Allah's name, some of Allah's names, and name their attributes or name their idols with the names of Allah. Thirdly, you can deny and distort these names. You can deny it. For example, the pagans, they denied Allah is Ar-Rahman. They denied this name. They said, we don't know who Ar-Rahman is. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اسْجُدُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ Surah Isra, verse 172. They said, what is Ar-Rahman? We don't know who Ar-Rahman is. They denied Allah's name Ar-Rahman. Or you can distort the names of Allah. Distort the meanings of these names. And that is another deviation. Is that you don't understand them properly. Yet another way to deviate in Allah's names and attributes is to compare these names and attributes to those found in the creation. And to understand them in that light. So when Allah describes Himself with a certain name or a certain attribute, and this same characteristic is found in humans, then to understand that name and attribute, the way that it is found in humans, this is anthropomorphism. This is comparing Allah to the creation. A'udhu Billah. And this too is a deviation from Allah's names and attributes. The sixth principle, and the final of these principles we'll discuss today, and once again I'd like to remind you this is a brief summary. There's, this topic in reality can take a whole 30 or 40 episodes in and of itself. This is just a brief, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg, literally. The sixth principle is that we should affirm for Allah all the names and attributes that He has affirmed for Himself and understand them befitting to Allah. We should not understand them to be the way that we find them amongst ourselves. Rather, we affirm these names and attributes without comparing them to the creation, and believing that they occur in a perfect manner. And we don't think about this manner. We don't ponder, how does this name exist? How does this name occur? No. We fully believe and realize that we as human beings, as limited creatures, will never be able to understand the infinite. We will never be able to grasp the reality of the names and attributes. How do they occur? We don't know and we shouldn't ask. It is not our belief. Allah did not want us to do so. But this should not leave us to the other extreme, which is to deny these names and attributes out of a fear that we might compare Allah to the creation. So the sixth principle is that we take the middle path. We don't go to the one path of comparing Allah to the creation, nor do we go to the other extreme of fearing this comparison and therefore denying what is in the Qur'an and Sunnah. So we affirm what Allah has affirmed for Himself and what the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed for Him without comparing Allah to the creation, without specifying how it occurs, knowing that it occurs, understanding its meaning, but not understanding how. We understand the meaning, but not the actuality. This is the point. This is, this is a very important point. We understand the meaning, because Allah is speaking to us in Arabic. Allah describes the Qur'an, بِلِسَانٍ in Arabiyyin Mubin. Surah Yusuf, verse 3. It is a clear Qur'an that is revealed in Arabic. Allah speaks to us in a language that we understand and know. 
So he describes for us using Arabic terms which are well known in meaning, his names and attributes. To claim that we don't understand these names and, mean, and, and, and attributes is claiming that Allah is not clear in this, in this chapter, which is a sin in and of itself. Rather, Allah has spoken to us in a language that we understand, Arabic. And He has described for us, in Arabic, names and attributes. We understand the meaning, the linguistic meanings. So we believe in them. But we will never understand the actuality, how they really occur. And there's a beautiful hadith we quoted last time. If you can hand me Ibn Majah, volume 1. We quoted this hadith last time as well. It's a very beautiful hadith. And it describes for us and summarizes for us what we should do. What should be our understanding of the names and attributes? And this is the hadith of the latter, which we quoted yesterday, the laughing of Allah. When the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah laughs, what did the Sahabi say? Ya Rasulullah, does our Lord laugh? Look, he didn't ask, what do you mean he laughs? How can he laugh? How can Allah laugh? Laughing is a human character. No. When the Quran comes, when the Sunnah comes, you close your intelligence in the sense that you don't ponder over the names and attributes. What I mean by this is you do not ponder over the names and attributes of Allah. So the Sahaba immediately, he said, does Allah laugh? He understood the meaning of laugh. The Prophet said, yes. So the Sahabi said, in that case, I'll never give up hope of attaining good. I'll always expect the best from Allah. Look at the iman of the companions. Again, look up the hadith yourself. See it for yourself. Go back to the sources. This is what we do. Look at the companion. This is a companion. He asks the Prophet ﷺ, does Allah laugh? And the Prophet ﷺ says, yes, he does. He doesn't think, how does he laugh? What does he laugh? How does it occur? Laughing is something that goes out of the, is a breath. No, nothing. سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. And this is the point. Perhaps the best uh, ayah also to understand this is Surah Shura verse 11. Look up this ayah again. It's a beautiful ayah. Surah Shura verse 11. Allah says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There's nothing like him. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ And he is the one who hears and the one who sees. In this verse, Allah says there's nothing like him. And then he describes himself with hearing and seeing which is a description which is applicable to most of the creation. All of mankind or most of mankind hears and sees. Many of the creatures hear and see. So in one part of the verse, he says there's nothing like him. In the next part, immediately, he describes himself. He characterizes himself with characteristics which are found in other beings. Which shows you that when Allah says there's nothing like him, it means that the actuality of these names and attributes is something we will never understand. It doesn't mean that the names and attributes themselves will never understand them. We know that Allah is as-sami' and al-basir, the one who hears and the one who sees. We understand the meaning of hearing, the meaning of seeing. But how they occur, the actuality of their existence, this is beyond our limited, our confined mind. And this is the point, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever name and attribute we find in the Quran and Sunnah, we affirm it. Because Allah has affirmed it. We say it because Allah has said it. We understand it because it is revealed in Arabic. Clear Arabic. But we do not understand how. We do not understand the actuality. Perhaps the best example, and with this example we'll conclude, is the example of the person who came to Imam Malik, the famous scholar who died in Medina in the year 179 Hijri. And he said, O oh, Imam Malik, Allah says in the Quran that Allah has risen over the throne. How does this rising occur? I don't understand. Notice that this person affirmed that Allah has risen over the throne. He was asking about how does it occur. So Imam Malik became angry. His face became red. Sweat started pouring down. And he said, O oh, so and so, the meaning of rising, rising over the throne is well known. Linguistic meaning is well known. The how of it, how he has risen over the throne is unknown. To ask questions about it is an innovation. To believe in it is obligatory. And I think you're an evil person. Get out of the masjid. In other words, he's going beyond the, mind, the, the, the role of the mind. Allah says in the Quran that he has risen over the throne. We know what this means. The Arabic words, istawa ala al-arsh. We know what it means. So it is obligatory to believe in it because Allah says so. And it's, uh, its linguistic meaning is clear because it's in Arabic. But to ask how... To go beyond, to delve into realms that we shouldn't delve into? No. So we believe in every single name and attribute of Allah. It's linguistic meaning. We say that we understand the linguistic meaning. We know that it cannot exist the way that it exists in humans. And we say that however it exists, we are not 
asked to ponder over it. If we were to ponder over it, we would not be able to reach that understanding. Therefore, we believe, we hear, and we obey. Whatever Allah says, whatever the Prophet ﷺ says, we believe in it and we affirm it without thinking too deeply about, this, uh, about the actuality of this attribute. So we conclude by stating that this principle is a very simple principle. We believe in whatever Allah says in the Quran, whatever the Prophet ﷺ says in the Sunnah, we describe him as he described himself and we don't go beyond the understood meaning. We don't delve into how, why, what. No, we hear, we believe and we obey. With this we conclude our topic for today. We hope to see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.